distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you. Good morning to all of us. Uh, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, we have this program with ISIS since um, a few years. Uh, this year we are also celebrating 150 years of German-Thai diplomatic relations. We are not exactly part of the diplomatic part, but we are part of the people-to-people -people part or the non-government-to-non-government -non sector. Um, as a German, I feel very comfortable to open this uh, today's seminar, today's event. Um, as you see from the topic, you know, common clash with, with China, ASEAN, China, United States, Germany is not mentioned. So um, for us, it's uh, rather comfortable to um, to t attach, uh, attack this topic. Although, uh, as we are speaking, our Chancellor is visiting China with a large delegation. Seven ministers uh, have joined her. and. Um, uh, the special relationship between China and Germany is celebrated uh, today and tomorrow. Um, we have also very distinguished speakers here, and um, um, I'm very happy um, that uh, we were able to put this panel together uh, talking on these uh, themes. Um, when in 2008 I wrote a background paper for the Liberal Party's Foreign Affairs Committee of the German Parliament on the South China Sea conflict, the interest was not very, very big regarding this topic. Everybody was mesmerized by the uh, global financial and economic crisis. Um, that has changed ever since. And when we look into the newspapers today, every day we find some photos of people uh, uh, raising flags of various uh, countries on rocky islands who are submerged under the sea for uh, some time. Um, so uh, the, the focus has very much shifted. And if we look at the, the, the data, the, the incidence or the number of incidents has increased uh, uh, ever since 2010, you can say, significantly. I just returned from Taiwan, um, uh, where I attended a conference where uh, Thomas Christensen, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Asia and the Pacific, was speaking exactly on the topic of the rise of China and what we can expect. Um, when we look at um, the different players which are mentioned in the in the phrase or in the, the title of the seminar, we have of course China and uh, it's, it's rising, the rising power, and we have uh, there um, the challenges they have in terms of containing their nationalism and uh, to formulate uh, foreign policy and to manage uh, this conflict in a more coherent way than in the in the in the past. You all have heard the the phrase. Uh, the, the nine dragons uh, which are stirring up the South China Sea and we see the problems they have with uh, uh, adjusting and coordinating foreign policy or policy as regards the South China Sea. Then we have the US who has recently rediscovered China and uh, um, playing maybe the, the game of chess the Chinese uh, don't like very much. Some people see the encirclement, they see containment and uh, which is heavily denied by the State Department. But uh, we have a slight redeployment of uh, forces to Asia. And uh, uh, this is not only, uh, at the, uh, not only finding uh, people who are disenchanted with it, but also uh, highly welcome when we look at um, the, the different players, Vietnam, for instance, the Philippines, they're very happy that the US shows um, stronger presence in the region. For me, the tipping point uh, in, as regards the South China Sea was the event in 2010 when the Chinese humiliated uh, Japan when they had to return the captain of the, the fishing boats who had rammed into uh, patrol boats uh, of Japan. Uh, ever since, um, the escalation potential of this conflict is greater. And then we are here in ASEAN where we just had a summit in um, in Cambodia, and uh, we see um, how ASEAN is trying to struggle uh, to come to terms with the South China Sea conflict. Uh, but we have other players too. We have Japan, we have Korea, and even marginal players like Taiwan or either country or territory uh, has potential to escalate the conflict. Um, the two islands uh, Taiwan has claims on um, belong to a territory which is ruled by the DPP, the opposition party. And so even minor players have the potential for uh, great effect. 
and uh, that's why the South China Sea conflict is so, uh, so significant for all of us. So we have a dangerous mix um, and uh, a great potential and worst case scenario would see um, China's domestic economic situation worsening maybe um, and uh, uh, maybe internal uh, unrest rising where then a foreign conflict could serve to distract the, the attention of the Chinese people and this is something we all don't want to see. So with this I would like to, um, to start today's uh, event. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, very stimulating uh, presentations and a stimulating debate later on the panel and uh, I hope we'll have a, or I'm sure we will have a very, very interesting morning. Thank you very much for coming and uh, uh, I hope you have also the opportunity to contribute and ask questions later when we debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to come and uh, address you today. Uh, there is no question mark uh, after my title, The Coming War with China, that's because I like to be provocative uh, and not sit on the fence. Um, but I can't be as provocative as I wanted to be because I opened my mail to discover that Survival, which is the flagship uh, magazine of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, in the present issue has uh, uh, an article on the war of China by James Dobbins from the Rand uh, Corporation. So this, the prospect of a war between the United States and China is one that is now being debated, uh, and not before time, it should be said, because my basic thesis is that if you wish to avoid such a confrontation, as we all do, you have to talk about it. If you don't talk about it, then it's going to come along whether you like it or not. As Hillary Clinton said earlier this year, if we want to avoid another great power war, then we have, and I quote, to write a new answer to the question. And there are people who are much more qualified than I am on this panel to explain what that answer should be. But I am a professor who has studied war for 30 years, and that's the perspective from which I want to come today. So I hope at least I can formulate the question. I leave it to others, diplomatically and economically, to come up with different answers. Uh, it's not a prediction, because predictions have absolutely zero uh, usefulness in international relations or any social uh, science, uh, but it's about a possibility, not a probability. And it's the possibility that I want to address today. Uh, my point of departure is that we are, have entered a, a period uh, of history when it has become very fashionable to say that war between great powers is at an end, that it's historically, um, it's had its day. And there are a number of very prominent st uh, scholars, such as uh, Jonathan Muller in his book Retreat from Armageddon, or The Remnants of War, uh, John Horgan, a former uh, editor of Scientific American, has come out with another book recently called The End of War. These are based uh, on an understanding that war has become an impossibility between great powers, for reasons that I will touch upon at the moment. But they're also, of course, a fashion. And the fashion has been the end of the Cold War, which was the last great power conflict that didn't go hot, that didn't go nuclear. Uh, and, of course, post 9-11. And uh, to quote one uh, academic uh, across the road from me at King's College London, we've seen the demilitarization of interstate relations. Now, if this, is this part of a zeitgeist? Is this just a part of a cultural fashion? Or is it something which is more profound than that, which I would call a, a general climate of opinion, to cite the uh, uh, English philosopher Alfred Whitehead? And if it's a general climate of opinion, as I believe it is, we need to be a bit worried because we peer into the future, we make predictions for our own future fitness, but we also look back to the past in order to understand where we're going. And we've been here before. As a European, I can attest to the fact that in 1910, uh, no important uh, European of any consequence believed that there could ever be an interstate war again between great powers, and that included the military, by the way. Uh, and that is the first thing that I want uh, to start with. Because the analogy between this part of the world and Europe in 1913 is rather disturbing in many respects. And the two powers that I want to draw your attention to are Britain and Germany in 1913. Britain, the declining uh, power, 
uh, trying to manage uh, its decline. You may be familiar with uh, Elliot Cohen, possibly the National Security Chief, if Mitt Romney wins uh, power in November, who wrote an article saying that the Obama administration has accepted America's decline as something that is a global good that needs to be managed rather than reversed. Uh, but the Romney policy will, of course, be to challenge that, to suggest that, in fact, far from being in decline, the United States can make this the American century as it made the last. But Britain did accept its decline in the run-up to the First World War and was trying to manage it. Germany is an interesting case because Germany also is a very analogous to China. It grew faster than any other economy in the 19th century. It overheated. Urbanization from going from a principally rural country in the 1830s to a principally urbanized and industrialized power within 50 years was the fastest social transformation any country had had in history. Nationalism was in part the product of the middle classes being squeezed in cities with the working classes and finding that social harmony was very difficult. And the attraction of socialism for the working classes was precisely because it offered a future that uh, seemed to be beyond their grasp. And then there was the position of the army in German political life. Uh, Germany was a democracy in 1913, but it was an illiberal democracy. And it was a liberal because the army had a privileged place. They had a voice. And in some respects, they almost had a veto. And the army was resentful that Germany had not managed to get its place in the sun, that it wasn't as respected as they thought that its power uh, required it should be. They were in a hurry in order to be as powerful as quickly as possible. Analogies are, I think, quite interesting here. And as for the United Kingdom, it was a country that was not at ease with itself. It was deeply divided socially and deeply divided politically. The United States is a country not at ease with itself at the moment. Social divisions are not terribly great, but the political dysfunctionality is quite striking. We all comment about, about that. Some of it see it as a measurement of decline. Others see it as a passing fashion. I just remind you that in my country in 1912, uh, the country had more strikes that year than at any other time in its history. We were riven by suffragette problems, votes for women. We were riven by unionists in Ireland who were a, a challenging dominion status for Ireland. We had a constitutional crisis in the House of Lords. In fact, we were heading towards grave political instability, only avoided by the First World War, but coming to a peak in 1926 in the general strike, which was the nearest that Britain has come to a revolution in the modern age. An interesting book by Frank McLinn has just been published on that. So there you are. I don't think I have to draw the analogies uh, greater than that. There are some interesting historical parallels here. But history, of course, is useful up to a point. And we must go a little further than that. Why did we think in 1913 that war between great powers was impossible? We thought it was impossible because the economists told us so. And this was the first time in history that people were listening to economists for the first time uh, in terms of political decision making. And economists are eternal optimists in many respects, and I'll touch upon optimism in a moment. But for the first time in history, we were saying that war between great powers was impossible because of a globalized age. This was the second phase of globalization. Globalization begins in the 1780s. This was the second phase of globalization. And Paul Krugman likes to remind his readers, those of you who read the Herald Tribune or the New York Times, that uh, the world was much more globalized in some respects in 1913 than it is today. More globalized as in terms of world trade, being a percentage of world GMP. More globalized in terms of transnational capital flows as a proportion of uh, total world capital. More globalized in terms of the movement of people across the world, vis-a-vis -vis the rate of population growth. And for the first time in history, we had commodity price convergence, which, as Krugman says, is the best sign of integration and of economic globalization. And that is why people insisted that war between the great powers was a complete impossibility. The credit markets in particular and the bond markets, those were the key 
And because money was at that time supported by gold, we had real money in 1913, unlike the digitalized uh, money that we trade in today. It was assumed that, in fact, the only way of fighting a war was to print money within six months of going to war. That would lead to crippling inflation, and that would lead to the collapse of the world economy. Norman Angel wrote a book called The Great Illusion, in which he said that the international credit system had already made war obsolete. That was a book that sold two million copies in its uh, first two years, was translated into 25 different languages, and it sold particularly well in my country, the United Kingdom, which was the most globalized country in the world at the time, and loved the message that was being put forward. So that's the first point uh, I would say. We can all talk about, of course, global chaos if there is a war between Iran and the United States or Israel later this year. We could talk about global economic chaos if there were to be a war between North Korea, South Korea and the United States uh, at any time soon. We can think of the regional, perhaps not global chaos, that would have been occasioned by a war between India and Pakistan that almost happened 48 hours uh, in 1998. But of course, the war between the United States and China would be the big one in terms of its impact on the global economy. That is no reason why it won't happen. It's the first point that I want to make out because it did happen in the past. We've been here before. Second point I would make out, uh, would like to say, is that war was not only becoming prof unprofitable, as people thought in 1913, it was becoming embarrassing. Great powers didn't do this type of thing. Only lesser powers went to war. Uh, great powers changed their ministries of war to ministries of defense at the beginning of the 20th century. Such was the embarrassment uh, that war occasioned. And we have this argument today that it's anthropologically almost impossible to imagine two civilized countries who are interested in the welfare of their citizens and the quality of social life would put everything at risk by going to war against one another. Well, this depends very much on the story you're telling so yourself about what war is likely to gain. Now, one of the stories that we told ourselves in the 1850s and 1860s, it's a story the United States has been telling itself ever since, is that war promotes social progress, that war is a democratization project, uh, that nation building and state building and the projection of democracy are not only can you carry these out through war, but sometimes war is the only way in which you can realize those projects. The neoconservatives went to war in Iraq precisely on that understanding in 2003. When did this uh, idea first come into circulation? It came into circulation in 1856, and not in the United States, but in the United Kingdom, when the government of the day was debating the legitimacy, moral legitimacy, of a war. It was the war between Britain and China. It's called the Second Opium War in China. We call it the Arrow War in the United Kingdom. It was a young journalist that evening who was reporting for the New York Tribune. And he said it was amazing. He'd seen the future. He had seen a British prime minister standing up and said, the only reason we're going to war against China is not for a national interest or some strategic uh, asset. It is to civilize China. It is to open Chinese minds up to Western ideas. It is, of course, to open markets up to Western trade, but by opening up markets, you are also opening up ideas. An open economy produces what we would now call an open society. The language was different in those terms. The young journalist was Karl Marx, and he wrote to his readers to say he had seen the future, but the West had seized the moral high ground and was now legitimizing war in terms of going to war for other people not going to war for yourself. And he said there will be no end to these wars once you can convince yourself that you actually occupy the moral high ground. That, I would say, is still a very important narrative in the way in which the United States frames war when it needs to legitimize uh, its activities, less so the Europeans these days, but that's probably uh, a matter of power. In what way would the United States and China legitimize war, something that they both abhor uh, publicly? Well, one way, and I'm not a Sinologist, it, but I am aware of the public debate in China, particularly amongst people who are not in government but are in think tanks, is perhaps it would be a way of recreating the Sinosphere that disappeared in the 1820s. What was the Sinosphere? It was the old international system 
that had been part of Asian history for three to four hundred years, actually even longer. What the English did with the first Opium War was force China into a Western international system, which changed the rules in two respects. It was based, at least in theory, on the sovereign equality of states and therefore was a non-hierarchical system. All states were supposed to be equal, and it was based on contract, and the contract was international law. It was not based on tribute. Now, there are some people in China who do and would like to reconstitute the Sinosphere, uh, and there are some people who would see the South China Sea's discussions and, and debates uh, as being possibly a precursor uh, of this. Um, I'm not in a position to be able to uh, determine this one way or the other. I leave it to sinologists. I notice that two, no two sinologists can agree amongst themselves uh, on the future of China and where it's going. So I take uh, some, some hope from that. Um, but insofar as part of the patriotic education courses in school have brought the surveillance of history back to 1840 as a legitimizing principle for the party, which makes party rule historically inevitable as well as historically legitimate. I think this narrative is one that you should look at, because if anyone were to adopt that, officially or unofficially, then war would once again become a legitimate principle of action between states. And for the United States, I think it would be the, the speeches that we heard yesterday and we're hearing today. It's about American exceptionalism. It's about a, the American century. And if you're absolutely dedicated to making the first part of the 21st century the American century, and if you believe American exceptionalism, then it seems to me that you have a legitimate reason for once again thinking of war as an instrument of policy vis-a-vis -a, -vis a country that challenges American exceptionalism and challenges the idea of an American century. The third argument that uh, the uh, great thinkers and gurus of the early 20th century said why war couldn't happen was that war was all about deterrence. Long before the nuclear age, when deterrence became a popular term, uh, most writers and most governments were saying the only reason we are arming like mad, as Europe was in 1900, is to deter war, not to fight war to make war impossible. And you do that not through diplomacy, but by arms races. Arms races will stop you from going to war. Now this is very, I'm afraid, a frightening analogy in this part of the world, where there are countries that are arming pretty quickly, uh, where there is an arms race already, uh, I would say, about to happen in space, possibly, but certainly in cyberspace. And these are the two areas, by the way, where I think military conflict is most likely to manifest itself. But I'll come to that in a moment. What happened with the arms races uh, in the uh, early 20th century? Well, one English historian has said that the problem was Germany wasn't spending enough on defense. It was only spending 3.5% of GMP on defense in 1913, which was not enough for it to feel secure. Uh, and the reason, by the way, the Germans refused to spend more was that either they would have had to have borrowed more or they would have had to have taxed themselves more. And being fiscally prudent, as I'm glad to say Germany is still today, Germany did not go down the American model of over-borrowing, <laughs> but not, of course, taxing. By the way, if Germany had uh, increased its defense expenditure in 1913 by, by margins, its uh, debt would still have been smaller as a fraction of GMP uh, than France, Ger uh, uh, Russia, or England. And its debt service ratio would have been smaller than England's. And if it had increased tax, its taxation rates would still have been lower than England's. But fiscal prudence in 1913, some argue, was one of the reasons why war broke out. Now, why is this important? Because arms races and maintaining a balance of military power is part of an international system. It's part of the regulation of an international system, how an international system regulates itself. You have to remember that international systems are not complicated like machines, they're complex. Machines are complicated, but we know why they break down. We can even do computer modeling of air wings for metal fatigue, which is why most planes that do crash don't crash because their wings fall off in mid-space, in mid-air. You can't do this with complex systems. 
And the problem we have in the Asian system that the United States has been managing for a long time is that Americans are beginning to doubt whether it's self-regulating. So when you see 60% of America's military assets being turned to this part of the world, you have three questions to ask. Is this a way in which the United States is balancing China? Is it just a way of reaffirming your primacy in Asia? Or has the United States concluded that the system is no longer self-regulating? That in fact it's becoming destabilized? And if it's becoming destabilized, how you, do you stabilize it? Because when a system melts down, it melts down very quickly. It melted down in months in Europe in 1914. The international economy melted down in months in 2008 with the collapse of Lehman Brothers. It happens very quickly indeed. I'm not going to dwell any more on the history, as time is anyway going on, but I would just like to give you one statistic which is rather chilling. We got it wrong in 1913. War did happen. It was the worst war in human history up to that point. Here's the statistic. The total number of lives that were lost as a result of the First World War in Europe, as a result of the Russian Revolution that probably wouldn't have happened without it, and as a result of the Second World War, which would certainly not have happened without it, the total number of lives lost was one in eight of all people who were alive in 1913. That is the cost of getting your assumptions wrong. That's why we need to question our assumptions all the time and not put our head in the sand. But this, of course, is the point that I want to make. It's a philosophical point. But war is not self-subsuming. That means it's a philosopher's way of saying that war doesn't actually explain itself. So we can make a point that all great powers go to war against each other, and I would say that's a reasonable conjecture. I would say it's historically well informed. I would say it's actually probably true in the case of Europe between 1500 and 1900, but it is not universally true. It is not necessarily true for non-European or non-Western uh, societies. And there have even been cases where it's been untrue for the West itself. And the key one was the failure of the United States and the United Kingdom to go to war in the early part of the 20th century, even though America's main war plan was for war with England as late as 1938, when it changed to war with Japan. So yes, you can avoid great power conflict. But there are particular historical reasons why England decided that it wasn't going to challenge the rise of the United States, but we won't go into that. Second point, major point I want to make is be, care, be careful of optimism. A lot of people find these talks that I give rather depressing, if, if not uh, annoying, because we should be more optimistic, shouldn't we? And not cynically British and cynically pessimistic. Well, the fact is that optimism is itself problematic. Uh, and one man who has been making this argument for years is Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist, who says that there's been far too much optimism in economics, which is why we are in the mess that we are today. Why is there optimism in economics? Because economists believe that rationality should be the focus of their research and their computer models. And economies believe that the market is efficient because human beings exercise rational choices. And Kahneman has spent 30 years testing this uh, hypothesis, and he's come to the conclusion that, in fact, human beings are deeply irrational most of the time. We do not act on the basis of our own interests. That is not because we're selfless or altruistic. It's because we're not very bright. We misjudge intentions, including our own intentions. We miscalculate the risks we take. And we're swayed by very irrational factors. One of his tests was getting a judge who's about to enter a courtroom and deliver a verdict, to deliver a sentence on a person who's been found guilty, and ask him to do a, a mathematical product or puzzle that produces a low number. And he'll usually give a low sentence. And if it comes out with a high number, he usually gives a high sentence. That's the irrationality that we're dealing with. And the worst problem with optimism is that experts themselves tend to be overconfident about their abilities. And Kahneman has uh, suggested that if you go to a hedge fund uh, and you're trying to obviously maximize your profits and minimize your risks, uh, the point about hedge fund managers is that they don't actually have a great deal of knowledge. They have rudimentary skills, they can read balance sheets, 
They know about accounting law and taxation, um, but that doesn't help them choose the right stocks. Some of them are lucky, and you're betting on human luck, in which case you get lucky, but luck also tends to run out. So be very careful of experts who will tell you that war between great powers is at an end. I'll just give you one little vignette about Jonathan Muller who suggests that war is likely to become as obsolete as slavery and as dueling to other social practices which are as old as history itself, slavery and dueling. Well, it'd be wonderful to know that we lived in a world without dueling and a world without slavery, but unfortunately we don't. Dueling, go to the divorce courts in London and see husband and wife dueling there for enormously large sums of money. And as for slavery, the United Nations calculates there are 14 million slaves in the world today. That's a higher number than ever before in human history. But slavery's changed. Sex trafficking, bondage, in uh, bond debts in South Asia and places like that. Slavery continues, it has adapted just as dueling has adapted, and war will adapt. And war now has two areas which are completely new, cyberspace and outer space. And I think, I think the war will continue for some time yet. Now I wanted to conclude on a more specific note. Let me invoke an Aristotelian hierarchy of causes here. Aristotle said that when you look for causation, why two countries go to war, you have to look, first of all, for the preconditions, you have to look for the precipitants, and you have to look for the triggers. And when most historians write about the First World War, why it happened, they would tend to adopt this Aristotelian model. What would be the precondition uh, of war between the United States and China? The precondition for me is that the rise of China would destabilize the system, and the United States would not have the power to regulate the system. How would the rise of China destabilize it? i just give you five very quick ways. First of all, um, it's difficult for China to evaluate its power, given that unlike the United States in the 20th century and Britain in the 19th century, it's a very rich and a very poor country at the same time. So if you're looking, for example, at uh, GDP per capita, that's 120th in the world today. Uh, Britain had the highest per capita GDP in 1900. It was overtaken by the United States in 1880 in terms of GMP. But GDP per capita matters in terms of quality of life. And it also has a very low human development level. It's 101 on the uh, scale at the moment. How do you evaluate your power when 35% uh, of your population lives on $2 a day? This is a problem that we've never had to face in the international system since the mid-19th century. It may well be manageable. I just raise it as one of the factors that we need to look at. A second is, how do you translate your power resources into influence if you're not actually part of this networked world which the United States is looking to in the 21st century to extend and prolong its power. Just as Britain prolonged its power through financial services after 1870, when it ceased to be a competitive industrial state, so the United States seeks to maximize its power through networking. And of course it has a vast number of networks with which uh, it's at the center. Thirdly, how do you exercise power responsibly if you're unfamiliar with this? The U.S. essentially has run a demand-supply-side model for exercising its power. We supply power for which there is a demand. And there has been a demand on the part of countries like Japan and Europe and many other parts of the world since 1950. Of course, the problem comes in 2003 when you supply a service that nobody wants. It's called the invasion of Iraq. Then you delegitimize your uh, position in the world. But still, America is very good at selling the exercise of its power. And that is why the majority of ASEAN members are very keen that the United States still remains a primal, primary power in this part of the world. Fourthly, how do you share power with others? If avoiding conflict means sharing power, what historical models have you got? And China doesn't have a deep history of alliances. The United States has a long history of alliances uh, with other countries in which power is at least seen to be shared. 
even if it is not necessarily really shared. And finally, how do you conserve your power resources? How do you uh, avoid overstretch? Uh, how, you how do you decide to go for managing regional security rather than making yourself the primary power? These are all questions that have yet to be answered. And it would be very, very optimistic indeed to think that all the answers are going to be positive or it's going to be very easy and quick to exercise uh, those answers. And what about the United States? Well, I do see the United States as being in a country, a country in relative decline in terms of its power status, not necessarily an absolute decline. The question is, can the United States manage its decline successfully? There are conferences in China about this. Now, how can we help America manage its decline? It's very important. And I would say the United Kingdom actually was very successful at managing its decline in the 20th century. Why? Because it actually thought strategically. There was a major overhaul of British strategic thinking around about 1902, where we entered into alliance systems, where we decided that appeasement with the United States was the necessary policy if we were to head off a conflict there, where we tried to build up uh, diplomatic relationships. Can the United States think strategically? Well, one person who questions whether it can is Paul Kennedy, who teaches the grand strategy course at Yale University with uh, Charles Hill and with uh, Gaddis. And if you look at American strategic thinking in the quadrennial defense reviews of the last two or national security strategy papers, you'll find an absence of strategic thinking. What you have is a whole series of strategic objectives, a wish list of what you'd like to achieve with no understanding of how you achieve it. And what does the US want to achieve with China? It wants to achieve two things. It wants to hedge against China's rise. So it is engaging in a kind of hedge fund strategy Again, maximizing the chances that things are going to go well, but also minimizing the risks of things not going so well. Folding China into these security architectures, fast-tracking membership of the WTO, not trying to contain, but trying to manage and work with. And that's a highly sophisticated uh, and clever policy and response by the United States. But is it sustainable? politically in the American political system? That's a question that you have to ask. Or would it be seen, as Elliot Cohen would say, as part of seeing America's decline as a public good and prolonging it for as long as possible? And the second problem, it seems to me, with strategy is that successful strategic thinking not only requires narrative coherence, but it requires the ability to see a threat as an opportunity or a challenge to rise to and not as something that you constantly have to defend against. And I'm a little, uh, I'm a little skeptical that at the moment people who plan American strategy are quite as sophisticated strategically as they needed to be to avoid this conflict. As far as precipitants are concerned, uh, I would just say look at the roles of the military in both societies. In the case of China, the military does have uh, an, an unusual place, a more and more prominent uh, place uh, in, Amer in Chinese political life, and some see this as inherently dangerous. Uh, there, there is no doubt that nationalism is alive and well in Chinese military circles. The kind of books that uh, perhaps the party leadership doesn't encourage are read in military circles. But there is an impatience in the Chinese military the idea that the United States is in terminal decline, the idea that American primacy is finished in this part of the world, the idea that by 2035 China will be the number one power in the world. And that's a policy, I mean that's an idea that is challenged by the Chinese Foreign Ministry and publicly challenged by the leadership. The Chinese Foreign Ministry will say that China will overtake the United States as the number one political power and military power in the world not before 2050 or 2060. Well, that's far too late for people who are impatient, like the German military in 1913. Impatient to have one's place in the sun as early as possible. And as for the US military, well, the US military has been the beneficiary of $3.7 trillion spent on something called the War on Terror, which, by the way, is more money than the United States spent on the Second World War. As, dollar, as the dollar is valued today, 
what did America get for the Second World War? It got regime change in Germany and Japan, two striking success stories. And what has the United States to sh show for its $3.7 trillion, Iraq and Afghanistan? But the American military is going to remain a powerful constituent. It is already a powerful constituent on Capitol Hill. And it will remain a powerful constituent for a country that sees that it is more important now to have that asset if you're in decline than it was when you're actually rising. Remember, America practically demilitarized itself in 1947-48 because it didn't need a military. Well, we're a long way from a country that decides it doesn't need a military. So finally, and I end on this, what would be the trigger? Well, philosophers traditionally ask themselves the question, uh, why did war break out? Then we can explain how it broke out. There is a philosopher called Eric Parfit at Oxford who believes that's the wrong way of looking at it. If you know how a war will break out, you'll know why it will break out. It's difficult to imagine two thermonuclear powers being prepared to go to war using thermonuclear weapons, but you can imagine that if you want. It's much more likely that they will see the two areas, cyberspace and outer space, as the areas in which they can go to war with a good conscience, minimizing the harm that is done to each other. And it's much more likely that war will break out as a result of what one of them does in cyberspace, which will be seen as an attack on the other. We've already had a cyber war, Russia against Estonia in 2007. Not much fun if you're an Estonian citizen trying to take money out of a machine only to be told that you couldn't take your cash out that day because all the services were down. Not much fun to be uh, Googling on the internet to find that all internet access to the out world, outside world had to be suspended for two weeks because you were under cyber attack. That's the type of area in which I think conflict is likely to break out in the future. We have to be very careful about that. So I've now taken up my time, so I'll just make one important final remark. All of this, of course, ignores the importance of contingency. Changes in political leadership, a change in economic circumstances for both countries, a global crisis elsewhere. All of these things could make uh, our pessimistic scenarios rather unimportant. Never underestimate the value of contingency. In 1940, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was told by his chiefs of staff there's going to be a war with Germany, our number one enemy, and it will be precipitated by a war with Japan, our number two enemy. And no country wants to fight a war on two fronts. So let's do a deal with Japan, fight Germany, and then go to war with Japan at a time of our own choosing. The deal with Japan would have been selling China out. And the reason Roosevelt did not do this was, A, he was an internationalist who believed that China was a great power, or would be a great power one day, and would be part of this United Nations that was set up in 1942. Another internationalist was Wendell Wilkie, the Republican Party candidate in 1940, who wrote a book called One World, in which he put China at the center with the United States and with the Soviet Union as the future makers of the 20th century, and that was not to happen. There were American missionaries who every Sunday in their churches preached that to sell China out to the Japanese would be immoral. And there are American traders, of course, who as always have seen China as a huge consumer market, a market not to be traded in cynical moves. What would have happened if in 1933, on February the 13th, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had been assassinated by Giuseppe Zangara, who came very near to assassinating him, and his vice president had become president. Have you all heard of his vice president, John Nance Garner, a Texan conservative who hated internationalism and hated Franco Delano Roosevelt in the best American political tradition of vice presidents hating presidents and vice versa? I think history might have been very different. And that's why contingency is important. Last sentence here. There are many warlike situations that don't end in war. And historians still puzzle over why that is. Is it because of systemic factors which they haven't managed to discover? Or is it because of contingency? And we all hate contingency, social scientists, because we're told that history should be more important than individual human beings. But history is individual human beings sometimes. And on that, I hope, uh, guardedly optimistic note, I'll end. <laughs>